people go on about the 2000s as the best part of Formula One. Screaming V10s, cars dressed up like cigarette packets, Schumacher and Ferrari being a dominant force, screaming V10s, the circuit starting to evolve from classic tracks into these new state-of-the-art facilities, screaming V10s, and other fun stuff. Like screaming V10s. But jokes aside, when you look at it from a participation standpoint for engine manufacturers, it really should have been the best time for Formula One. Ferrari, Mercedes, Honda, BMW, Ford, Renault and Toyota all on the grid supplying engines, and McLaren, BAR and Williams had some sort of manufacturer backing, even if they weren't necessarily a full up works team. Think of how a couple of the BTCC teams have manufacturer backing but they're not actually run by those manufacturers, if that makes any sense. West Surrey Racing runs BMW, rather than BMW running BMW, and this was the case during the fabled Super Touring era as well. But in 2002, a pair of red and white cars appeared on the Formula 1 grid in their bid to get to the top and take it to the likes of Ferrari, McLaren and Williams, but they never actually achieved anything in the 7 or 8 years that they were in the sport. And that team is Toyota. Toyota was no stranger to motorsport, they'd been at Le Mans and the World Sports Car Championship during the Group C era, they'd been in the British Touring Cars around the start of the Super Touring years, they were also in the World Rally Championship, running those instantly recognisable Castrol colours with the Corolla, because we're just going to ignore the Celica and it being kicked out of the Championship for the whole restrictor plate thing. And their road cars such as the Supra have attained cult following as well, Supras today still being used as drift machines, and there's also the AE86 of which the Panda variant has become a super expensive thing and the price has just been jacked up, all because of a f***ing cartoon. Toyota's decision to enter Formula 1 was signed off by the board in 1998, but the first working prototype of a car to be entered into the World Championship wouldn't be ready until 2001. While it worked, they looked at the data and decided, actually we'll wait until 2002 to get some of these bits and pieces ironed out and hit the ground running then. In Japanese. Probably. And so the team got onto the grid for 2002, meaning in that season there were seven teams with some sort of manufacturer input on the grid. Seven so-called works teams and four privateers. Those privateers being arrows that would not see the end of the season, Minardi, Sauber and Jordan. The first Toyota car was designed by Dago Rora, Gustav Brunner and Rene Hillhorst, with former Ferrari engineer Luca Marmoni designing the 830 horsepower engine that would power it. The whole thing was designed and built at Toyota's factory in Cologne in Germany and was a modified version of the test car that they'd run through 2001, a test car that lead driver Mika Salo had described as a donkey because it was overweight. He called it several other words but I've used my f-bomb limit for this video. The car used in 2002 was labelled a bit more conventional than what they were using before. I've put some more pictures up of it, but there are rules and I can't, I can't do that, so you've just got to stare at my face for a little bit longer. But I guess it just means that, we know how Martin Brundle usually describes it, strip all the stickers off and paint them white and you won't be able to tell the difference. Toyota had just built something that just fit on the grid and was doing what everybody else was doing. And things looked promising right off the bat as Sala brought the car home in 6th place for a point at that season opening Australian Grand Prix. We'll leave out the part where they were pretty far down the grid, Sala 3.3 seconds off Barrichello's pole time and McNish 3.7 seconds off Barrichello, but one of them scored a point at least, due to Barrichello breaking too early for the first chicane on the first lap and causing an 8 car pileup, but they scored a point! They scored a point. McNish, who at the time was rated as one of the best drivers in the world to not be in Formula 1, having already finished first and second at Le Mans in 1998 and 2000, almost had a point of his own in Malaysia, but Toyota made a pit stop blunder and he would just miss out. But Toyota's big problem in 2002 was reliability as well as performance. Their only points of the season would be scored at Australia and Brazil, both with Salo, with Salo then suffering five retirements in a row at Monaco, Canada, the Nürburgring, Silverstone and Manicor. Salo would have 6 retirements, McNish 8, and then wouldn't start the Japanese Grand Prix due to that horrendous shunt he had at the 130R. If you haven't seen it, do so. Toyota had written the 2002 season off as a learning exercise before the season had even started, but even then, given the fact that they were the world's biggest car manufacturer and had a lot of money, they finished 10th overall in the Constructors' Championship, behind Minardi, and only finished ahead of Arrows because Arrows went bust halfway through the season so they really had to do a lot better for 2003. In comes the TF103, driven by Olivier Panis and reigning kart champion Cristiano De Mata, which raised a lot of eyebrows. This was a factory-entered team with aims of reaching the top, and they'd hired a guy who had once won the Monaco Grand Prix through everybody else crashing and never really recovered from his broken legs, 
In the other car is a guy who had been racing in the thick of the American Open Wheel Civil War, but that car that Damata won in was powered by a Toyota engine, so it was probably a business thing. But the car did score points, and had been 1-2 at the British Grand Prix due to the confusion surrounding the track invader I've done a video on previously. Damata actually outscored Panis 10-6, with the 16 points good enough for 8th in the constructors. But again, with their budget, resources and standing in the automotive world, they should have been doing a lot better. For 2004, Toyota was insistent they were going to do better, with designer Gustav Brunner saying, the TF103 was a highly competitive package, Bullshit. but unfortunately we couldn't get all the performance out of it. Theoretically, the TF104 is an evolutionary step up from the TF103, but in fact the TF104 shares not a single part that we used in the TF103. We improved every single inch of the chassis and redesigned every important internal component. We achieved a great leap ahead aerodynamically, made the car lighter overall and increased the rigidity of the chassis. The thing is, every upgrade that had come to a Toyota up until this point had been described as an evolutionary step up from the previous one, and I can't say that word for some reason. But it, it was just a case of, yeah, it's fine. Okay, it's on fire, but it's fine. And it was working until it, it set on fire, and Brunner was later sacked because Toyota had had enough. You can't just make the chassis more rigid and strip weight off to make the car better. You've got to do other bits and pieces. So they brought in Mike Gascoigne, who had worked at Jordan to try and improve the car, but it was too late for him to do stuff with the 2004 car, so he's set to work on the 2005 car instead. Toyota was also at the centre of allegations regarding industrial espionage as the TF103 had a lot of similarities to Ferrari's F2002, which was then investigated by the district attorney in Cologne. What had happened was, as reported by The Guardian in the November of 2003, is that a Ferrari employee had moved to Toyota and supposedly taken data with him. Police raided Toyota's factory, took computers, hard drives, laptops, everything, and then questioned a man who worked for Toyota but was later released without charge. This sounds very familiar. Teams copy all the time. Aston Martin most recently copying Red Bull side pods, Tyrrell building their own Lotus 79 for the 1979 season, and everybody else scrambling for their own double diffusers and blown diffusers at the turn of the previous decade. Having blueprints is an actual no-no. Ideas can be transferred because you can't police an idea, shout out to the Deep Space Nine episode Far Beyond the Stars, but taking sensitive data will land you in trouble. But only if your name rhymes with McCarran. But the TF-104 and the 104B were a disaster. Eighth in the standings with just nine points, only beating Jordan and Minardi. And even Jaguar, who were also underachieving, must have been laughing at them. But Gascoigne's new TF-105 would be there in time for the 2005 season, which should, given his track record, improve things. And they did. In 2005, the TF-105 scored two pole positions, a fastest lap, and bagged five podiums, with the only blot on the season being Schumacher's crash at Indianapolis that kick-started the whole tyre gate thing. Including Indianapolis, the car retired at four Grand Prix, finishing all the others except Australia with at least one Toyota in the points. 88 points overall, and fourth in the championship. Just 12 points behind Ferrari, but also 12 points ahead of Williams. Best season on record, and a huge jump up so things must have been going well. Or were they? Because everybody was once again looking at the driver pairing and going, why? They'd hired Ralph Schumacher from Williams and were paying him an absolute fortune to be there, leading to a lot of jokes at the time that Toyota must have thought they'd hired the other guy instead. They also did two glory runs in qualifying to look good. At Indianapolis, they low-fueled the cars to get on the front row before they had to withdraw with the other teams, and then did the same at the team's home race at Suzuka, leading to Schumacher pitting after just seven laps. But at least the FIA dropped all the charges regarding the whole having Ferrari data thing. And it didn't get any better for Toyota. It got worse. In 2006, they'd get just the one podium with Schumacher, and Heat and Trolley would get a smattering of points elsewhere, but sixth place overall with more than half of the points of the previous year was a huge step back. Their chief rivals, Honda, had utterly demolished them that year, and Honda had won a race with Jensen Button at Hungary, which also must have rubbed salt into the wounds. In 2007, it got even more embarrassing for them because Williams was now a customer team, and Williams beat them by 20 points. At least in 2008, Toyota was able to spend Schumacher's pay packet on the car, but once again, their driver lineup wasn't exactly what people would expect. They now had Timo Glock alongside Trulli in the car, and Trulli did get a podium at the French Grand Prix. 
but the problem was the car still wasn't challenging like they would have wanted, and the only real headlines a Toyota car would get all year was when Glock was involved in the scenes at the end of the Brazilian Grand Prix. It was a return to form, but the bean counters were now sweating due to the financial crash. 2009 would start with Toyota on paper being able to challenge for wins. Trulli would get a podium at Australia, a race tarnished by the whole Ligate thing, and also Bahrain. Glock would get a podium at the truncated Malaysian Grand Prix, and second places again at Singapore for Glock and Suzuka for Trulli. Despite having the controversial double diffuser that was also in use by Braun and Williams, Toyota wasn't able to make the whole thing work, at least not how they would have wanted to. They must have also been looking at what Braun was doing with very gritted teeth, because that team used to be Honda, Toyota's chief rivals. And now Braun was operating on a shoestring budget after buying the whole thing for like a pound or whatever it was, and now was just destroying everybody with Barrichello and Button. The TF109 went from locking out the front row in Bahrain to the back row at Monaco, a very inconsistent car that was 7th at Silverstone and then 17th in Germany, 6th in Hungary but 14th in Italy, 12th at Singapore but 2nd at Suzuka. The only saving grace it had was that this was the car that gave us Kamui Kobayashi. Toyota would finish 5th in 2009, 9.5 points behind Ferrari, those half points coming because of Malaysia. In all, it's estimated that Toyota spent $4 billion between 2002 and 2009. That's including the $600 million budget that they supposedly have for 2008. But on top of this, spending a lot of money for little return, there's also the baffling driver combinations that they produced. McLaren had Raikkonen, Ferrari had Schumacher, Williams had Montoya, Renault had Alonso. Toyota had Olivier Panis and Cristiano de Mata. Now, Panis, before his leg break at Canada in 1997, was on for a very good season in inferior equipment, but he was at the end of his career when he joined the team. McNish is, and still is, a respected sports car driver. Trulli had loads of experience, but Toyota just continually hired mid-drivers with no X-Factor. With the amount of cash at their disposal, they probably could have raided some of the driver development pools and maybe poached Vettel away. Hamilton, Kibitza, drivers like that or even grab a couple of the more experienced guys that did have something. Heidfeld, maybe. But instead, they hired Ralph Schumacher and paid him $20 million to finish sixth every race and only beat Trulli by two points. What also didn't help is that the team was based in Germany, which really narrowed down their scope for employment. With seven of the 10 F1 teams in the UK, it means that personnel can easily move jobs. James Vowles moving from Mercedes to Williams is a prime example. Those two factories aren't too far away. Vowles probably didn't even have to move house. Asking an engineer or a designer or whoever to pack everything up and move from Banbury to Cologne when he's got a wife and two young kids is a big ask, because in Germany they don't speak English as a first language, so everybody's got to learn a new language, the kids have got to go to school, it's all going to be very, very tough, and they would have all probably declined a job offer due to all of that. That's two things. Something else I didn't know until I put all this together is that Toyota was initially developing a V12 for when they came into Formula 1, but what happened then is that the FIA decided, nope, from 2001 onwards, it's V10 only. So Toyota had to scrap the V12 idea, redesign the engine, redesign the car, which in turn spent more money and sort of put them on the back foot a little bit more, because if they'd been able to run that V12, they probably would have been able to just carry on and not have to start again so soon before coming in, if that makes any sense. And something else that has cropped up time and time again in all of the articles and stuff I've read is that corporate interference was a huge part of it. Mike Gascoigne was sacked for having a confrontational personality. Basically, Toyota would say something and he'd go, I can't do that because X, Y, Z. And that really, really wound Toyota up. I mean, he probably said it a little bit more forcefully than that, but it is what it is. Salo and McNish were lambasted by Toyota for not braking where the other cars are braking, even though Salo and McNish were saying, our cars can't do that, it needs fixing. Toyota also, in 2006, switched from Michelin to Bridgestone, probably so they could be a Japanese team on Japanese tyres, but the technical team said, don't do it because the car has been designed around these Michelins. The suspension will need completely redesigning. So will the car. The whole, the whole thing's just not going to work. I guess it could be said that Toyota underestimated how difficult Formula 1 would be, and coming in as the world's biggest car manufacturer meant that success would be a certainty after a couple of seasons, going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the likes of Ferrari and McLaren. But Toyota's way isn't the F1 way. 
After sacking Gascoigne, they hired someone that didn't have that same confrontational attitude, and things went back the way they were. Hiring someone similar might have made them see some sense. The race raised a very good point. At the end of 2006, Toyota had an opportunity to pay Ross Braun whatever he wanted. Braun went to Honda instead. After the financial crash that resulted in Honda withdrawing, Braun bought the team, and then dominated with a double diffuser like Toyota had, on a shoestring budget, and then laid the groundwork for the Mercedes juggernaut that would later come. Poor driver recruitment, poor attitude to the challenges, poor team structure, not reacting to what everybody else was doing, the desire to do it their way, all things that caused the Toyota F1 project to be almost doomed from the start. Proof that you can't always buy success. 139 races, 13 podiums, not a single win. Still though, it makes you wonder what would have happened if they'd stuck around. Toyota basically started the whole hybrid revolution. Okay, maybe not started it, but still, the Toyota Prius is the hybrid car. It's sort of become synonymous with the hybrid car. They could have taken that technology into 2014. Maybe they would have had the success that Mercedes did as an engine supplier. Who knows? But they might have just spent themselves silly with that as well. So then a look at the doomed Toyota F1 project. If this has been new for you, then do like the video so I know a good job was done. And if you want more stuff like this, get subscribed with the bell on so you never miss out on anything else I do around here. And that's it. Thanks to the patrons and channel members who support the channel at a more personal level. And if you want to join in with supporting the channel and helping to keep things running around here, you can do so by hitting the link in the description that will take you to Patreon. Or there's a link underneath the video, a button type of thing, if you want to be a channel member and spam some Roberto Moreno emojis in the chat. Also in the description is a link to Discord and my socials, or if you just want to do a one and done donation, there is a link for Super Thanks somewhere on this page or on your app, whatever it is. So until next time, I've been Aidan Maud, have a cracking day wherever you live in the world, and I'll see you all again soon for another video. Goodbye.